see they got this March 18th. There's another one for the other property, March 18th, 2009. So I was right on that when I did the anchor date. There's a 607 or another number. They got them transposed. It's too funny. They screwed up. They screwed up bad, and they know it. They didn't even have enough guts to answer any of this. This is theirs. And, of course, this is a draft. These are the attorneys that came in first from this Fowdy and Fowdy. These folks did. Well, then they brought in Tammy Lynn Ortman. And here's the note they brought. This is the P.O. Box 809 Memphis, Tennessee, which I probably need to change. Or I could tell Scott. Anyway, I'll highlight that. P.O. Box, that's the Brandon Allen of DTZ Barnicky. And they there's no allonge, but they attached an allonge. This is the exhibit that they brought in. Right? They're funny. And then they brought this in. With no case number. No MIN. For the wrong amount. Here comes four or five won't have a signature. This one won't have a little initial at the bottom. But she brings in one with an initial. See? And then this is different, too, on the fake mortgage. Because they're running writers behind the scenes, see? All those writers are going behind the scenes. All the dates when they do things that go 90 days out, 30 days out, they're running a writer. They're running loans. They just keep on working the system like nobody's business. There's a community rider, right? Supposedly. This is what they put in. See that? March 18, 2008. See this? September 21st is when supposedly U.S. Bank. March 18th is instrument number 608. And 607 is what they're coming in after. The... Uh, 938 South 17th and the 422 Randolph will forever be pulled together even though Rachel didn't buy it, right? They just used her name to do stuff, right? And think that's okay. Judge Horn does. Matthew Fowdy, attorney at law, prepared that instrument, correct? Oh, and here comes U.S. Bank. Date of March 14th. Let's see what this says. This is funny. It should not be considered as as insuring insuring accuracy of the street address as it relates to the insured premises. They make me sick. You can tell what they're doing right here. Insurance again and disclaimers for insurance mills. Our regulations, this tax in, industri in insurance industry. <laughs> oh, because this is so fake and she never signed it and they know it. This belongs to the 1007 U.S. Highway, a State Road 38, the county property. And this was not dated properly and they know it. Now they went back to the new one under the new. See the hope funds? They this was not the proper one and they they were told that. So they couldn't answer it at all. They didn't answer it. They never answered it. Why? Because they couldn't. So I could do the October response and I will. We added the affidavit in later. See that? See the date on that? That's when that was filed. So something's going on there. Answer to plaintiff's summons. Since the summons is directly postured towards Rachel Diddy, Capital One Bank is not listed as a defendant as it is on complaint and therefore was not served process. Will this omission from the record allow for the plaintiffs to claim a right to something without opposition from Capital One Bank N.A. in this forum? Simply states Rachel Diddy et al. Then after 
or with the summons is directed to Rachel Diddy only. This is an indication that there are other parties of interest to this suit brought by Plaintiff's U.S. Bank National Association. It indicates they knew this when filing. Number two, disagree with statement. The nature of the suit is to foreclose mortgage. Furthermore, upon an examination of all the relevant facts, it appears it is to gain ownership or a right to a mortgage that was not present to U.S. Bank National Association in the first place. We deny any amount of or monies are owed to Plaintiff's U.S. Bank National Association. Answer to plaintiff's complaint on note and to foreclose mortgage. Plaintiff's U.S. Bank National Association, through their attorney, fashion a heading with two issues. Number one, cannot admit or deny. Number two, admit in part. In receiving this suit and in her defense preparation, she located house buying folders that were given to her concerning 422 Randolph Street, Richmond, Indiana, 47374, to her mother. It was discovered around October 6, 2012, that there was indeed a warranty deed and Stickle Properties LLC transferred this instrument to Rachel Diddy for $1. The instrument signed by Paul E. Stickle, member of Stickle Properties LLC, was notarized by Sean Sorrell and prepared by Richard E. Boston, attorney at law. That's the private Chapter 7 bankruptcy guy, right, too? And did I in part, Rachel Diddy had no knowledge of this fact until the suit against her or this warranty deed. It shows faxes from or to premier mortgage and abstracts of Richmond. See Defendant's Exhibit 1. Deny someone in the progression here has sanitized and all loan numbers, fax transmissions, indeed some writing omitted on the plaintiff's exhibits A and B, not to mention the loan numbers and FHA HUD numbers being covered. If the plaintiffs would have checked their assertions as it relates to a recorded instrument, they may have come up with what up had they went to the courthouse. See defendants exhibits 1, 2, and 3 in comparison and as the loan and fax numbers, right? Deny. Number 4, we deny According to the plaintiff's exhibit B, the Mears assignment was made back in March 2008. So why falsely further or try to enter two assignments of one property? Two Mears. Furthermore, as to fraud, they are not entitled under Indiana Code. See defendant's exhibits 1, 3, and 5. Deny the security instruments alluded to in this defendant's exhibit 1. Also, Dana Kozak is a robo-signed or rubber-stamped signature as letter received to Rachel Diddy dated October 2009. Last page shows similarities to the plaintiff's exhibit D signature. They have yet to allude to the protections under FHA and HUD for Rachel that they clearly knew about, and they put her payments in suspense account. Also, Rachel Diddy received a letter from U.S. Bank stating, in part, the security instrument mortgage or deed of trust that secures the repayment is recorded in the public land records of Wayne County representing their indebtedness to your mortgage loan. How can that be? It is our exhibit, the warranty deed. With no loan attachment, Rachel Diddy did not sign the plaintiff's Exhibit D. It is in the form of an allonge, and only signatures are on the page. Highly suspicious. In addition, the defendants should be sanctioned for submitting falsified and inaccurate information. See Exhibits 1, 4, 5, 6, and 7. Number 6, Deny. Does not state when, just that she owed $518.48 on June 18, 2012. See Defendants Exhibit 7. Number seven, deny. They're going to insert it via court. They did not send, nor was it included. It's dated September the 14th, 2010. This is not the compliance required from Indiana Code. Number eight, deny is false. Rachel Diddy is not the maker. Rachel Diddy was not enriched, and she benefited in no way. Which one of the mortgages are they speaking of here? The one with the sanitized numbers or the one they fabricated? It appears Dana Kozak, U.S. Bank, and one Ed Fisher, U.S. Bank, Paula Leslie, First Horizon, was re-registered and already registered mortgage twice with mirrors after cha changing the numbers, have prepared and falsified papers. The maker of the drawer does this sort of thing, not the victim. That is what Rachel Diddy is in this instance. See Defendants Exhibit 8. Deny for reasons above. Furthermore, the plaintiffs may be liable for damage to Rachel Diddy, including the subsequent attorney fees, costs, etc. They have already declared them due several times, and most recently the letter dated August 28, 2012. See Defendants Exhibit 4. Number 10. Deny. See all of the above. For if they thought they would th th that that why okay. See all of the above. For if they thought that why would they having excluded numbers and pertinent valid documents. Number 11, deny this claim that they have an interest. Furthermore, the judgment was contested by me and is for credit card that I became unable to pay due to becoming unemployed. However, I do plan on paying the court order debt. See Defendant's Exhibit 9. Wherefore, defendant prays for a continuance of at least 30 days so that Richard can hire an attorney and amend her answers and counters defenses and demands as has become necessary due to this wrongful action, including any and all players, parties of interest in this matter. The defendant, Rachel Diddy, may be entitled 
uh, relief under various laws and statutes, code, etc., both civil and criminal remedies available to her. Rachel Diddy asks this court to protect and preserve her remedies available under the law as the facts emerge. Furthermore, from my eyes on the facts of this, the plaintiffs are attempting to gain a security instrument, interest, then complain or establish to a falsified and sanitized document a note. Then they move to foreclose without any of the other parties of interest in this case named. In title, simply state Rachel Diddy at all, yet mention one purported company in the body of the complaint on note. Then to foreclose on mortgage. You see, in order to foreclose on a mortgage, you need to establish the mortgage note was yours in the first place to even pursue. The plaintiffs use this honorable court as a vehicle for further enrichment. They were successful, weren't they, Judge Horn? This, um, if nobody ever really had anything, though, did they? This is a big scam on everybody, isn't it? And you participated. You said, I just have to wonder if we are uh, we are uh, retaliating as opposed to the normal course of business or something similar to that, correct? This answer to plaintiff's summons, complaints, and initial defense attached and signed have been prepared by Carol Isaacs, Rachel Diddy's mother. I'm not a lawyer or legal representative. For all the reasons and for all proper relief stated here, and we pray the judge allows a stay of an extension of time to defend, allowing us approximately 30 days for a lawyer to be retained. This reply, defense's counterclaims and request to stay an extension of time are also signed by Rachel Diddy. Respectfully submitted, Carol Isaacs, and I give my address and phone number back then. And Rachel Diddy, her address, right? An initial defense is directed to plaintiff reported note holder or its predecessor and other parties of interest standing, failure to name indispensable parties, failure to show ownership of note and mortgage, unclean hands, violations of TILA, violation of RESPA, violations of HOPA, extortionate extension of credit, fraud upon Rachel Diddy, payment, violation of unfair and deceptive trade practices act, the plaintiff note owner and its predecessors in interest also violated the unfair and deceptive trade practices act, FS501, period 201 at SEC, unconscionability in light of all the foregoing defenses and on the face of the purported loan documents, the terms and circumstances of the note and mortgage were unconscionable when made and were unconscionably exercised. It is unconscionable to enforce the mortgage by foreclosure, rescission, lack of jurisdiction, failure to provide FDCPA notice, duress, failure to state a claim for which relief can be granted. And I say company in the body of the complaint on the note then to foreclose the mortgage. You see, in order to foreclose on the, the answer to the plaintiff's summons and complaints, and okay, there. And then we signed it again. So. And they were forwarded that, but then Rachel amended, and I don't know if the amended, this was the one December the 28th, and these are the people that were named, and it was stamped, um, he said, um, what's his face, Andrew Thompson said, oh, they accepted it all, all these people were served to U.S. Bank National Association and A. Lingo Real Estate Incorporated, Broker Agent Tim Moore, Broker Agent Josh Rader, Listing Agent Kristen Rader, MetLife, Metropolitan Life Trust, First Horizons, First Tennessee, Jessica McGuire, Mears, and MBRS. Because it says that back in those documents. And let me go back and look at this. They, I'm sh main boardroom system, folks. Stickle Properties LLC, Paul Stickle, a.k.a. Steckler, Fidelity National Financial Incorporated, Brian Steckler, Abstracts of Richmond Incorporated, Sean Sorrell, DTZ JJ Barnicky, Canadian Brandon Allen at all, co plaintiffs versus Rachel Diddy Capital One at all defendants. Answer to plaintiff summons. Since the summons is directly postured towards me, and we go into what was said before. And answer and counter complaints to plaintiff's complaint on note and to foreclose mortgage with additional parties named. Plaintiffs U.S. Bank National Association through their attorney fashion a heading with two issues. And number one, we admit they operate in Richmond, Indiana and internationally and are under other obligations to the law elsewhere as well as here within the United States. And then we admit in part, just like we did before, and then I go into a summary, see. Or she does. 
because she signed all this. Deny is false. I write you Diddy was not the maker. The makers were Jessica McGuire in cahoots with Tim Moore, Sean Sorrell, Paul Stickle, and others, as may be discovered. I wrote you Diddy was not enriched, and I benefited in no way. The mortgage note and mortgage are submitted by plaintiffs with sanitized numbers, and they have changed the numbers, and they know and actually further perpetrated the fraud. It appears Dana Kozak, U.S. Bank, and one Ed Fisher, Paula Lastly, and Horizon, has re-registered and already registered and previously assigned mortgage twice with mirrors after omitting the numbers and turning them into the court as evidence. One assignment on or around March 14, 2008 on the property descriptive 422 Randolph Street, Richmond. Another assignment of the same property on or around and then most recently on September 21, 2012 but not recorded in the recorder's office until approximately days before or after. I'm sure they know I left that blank but those are anchor dates. For reasons above, furthermore, are liable for many reasons to write you did, including the subsequent attorney fees. January 21st, furthermore, the judgment was contested by me, and as a for a credit card, it became unable to pay. Since I was young, I dreamed of owning my own home and land. Land and home. Around 2006, I started saving money for my wages as a CNA preceptor, certified nursing profession. In 2008, I, Rachel Diddy, became a first-time home buyer on or around March 14, 2008, to my knowledge at that time. The professional persons involved in my first time home buying experience I had never met until my first time home buying experience. I chose Lingo Real Estate due to their trusted business image within our community. A friend, Deborah Day, told me about her agent, Tim Morse, so I called him. We met for the first time around January 2008. I signed a purchase agreement on January 21st, 2008, and gave Tim Moore approximately $500 for what I believed was earnest money. Record shows promissory note. From January 2008 through March 14, 2008, I met several other professionals. They came together in unison to help me buy a home for me and my two minor sons. Mark Green, an appraiser from First Horizon Home Loans, Agent Jesse McGuire, I met with the Sean Sorrell of Abstracts of Richmond, Lingle's Tim Moore, reported buyer, Paul Stickle, or reported, uh, reported buyer, I put that in there on purpose because he is a buyer. He's a seller, though, see. But he's listed as a buyer. They screwed up. They sent the crook files, see. <coughs> Flurry of paperwork and the transaction was cleaned. I was happy and became a homeowner. I was given several folders and I put them away for safekeeping. I did not disturb them until this judicial complaint and in my defense. Summary. Incorporating all of the above in answer to complaint and above herein is this summary. I brought my first home in March, foreclosed against me by U.S. Bank from approximately December 2006 or early legal temp. Uh, Legal agent Tim Moore, Paul Stickle, Jessica McGuire, and Sean Sorrell participated in a scheme to defraud home buyers and steal their identities and fraudulently, fraudulently use the identities and forged signatures to defraud several mortgage lenders in connection with unknown amount, but as to fraudulent acts against fragility, approximately $279,000 plus interest so far discovered in real estate loans for the purchase of land. The land was not theirs, the seller's that there's the sellers in the first place. The seller Paul Stickle's name was not on the property till abstracts of Richmond Incorporated in cahoots with Lingle and Stickle actually got Rachel Diddy's my name and backdated titles and various false and unrelated properties under my name. That the insurance provided to the false loans manufacturers was indeed used by the perpetrators numerous times. Jessica McGuire was the agent for the loans. Jessica McGuire fed them into MetLife and J.J. Barnicky in Canada and has part in all of this land stealing or takings as well. Also, the loan amount of 66949 they MetLife First Horizon aside or sold to U.S. Bank is also the amount given on the forged affidavit that indicates I was married and has Sean Sorrell as notary and she worked with Sabrina Bartram who backdated the Alta policy for the fraudulent loan, dating it back to February 5, 2006 for the purchase made on March 14, 2008. I have reported this those forged and fraudulent documents in my affidavits and various complaints to date. Exhibit 11. If the loan was based on fraudulent documents and signatures of MetLife First Horizon sold it or transferred it, then U.S. Bank would have a claim against First Horizon Met not, MetLife as I do. MetLife was a lender all along, undisclosed to me in this honorable court. But I would make an educated guess that they they all have an agreement, and the closed timing and the assignment, etc., would lead to a reasonable person to the same belief that U.S. Bank National Association N.A. knew all along there were problems with the assignment and security instruments used. FNF is the Alta Policy Title Insurancer and an agency relationship with FNC's Brian Steckler with Abstracts of Richmond Incorporated. 
Now I had also been contacted and laughed and told me it was just a mistake. I had no idea what I was talking about. This stance in the face of allegations of identity theft and fraud and for all of the above reasons leads me to have a reasonable belief that there are a slew of worms in this can. Undisclosed agreement. Here are the list. Loan amounts 500 twice, 6,000, 67,398, 66,949, 131,000. Other various amounts as is, is, is discovered. Loan numbers, including various combinations used as mirrors, FHA, HUD, and possibly BA numbers involved. Loan number 9902230974, FHA 151-8568474-703, loan number 0063136717, loan number 0223097, FHA case number 151-8568474. MIN number 10000852006313671766 FHOPD 00000000912 and 30 others as may be discovered properties and land involved thus far 1007 State Road 38 938 South 17 422 Randolph Street not complete list more may be rendered in discovery anchor dates involved home purchase agreement January 21st home purchase agreement February the 5th insurance policies issued 313 2008 insurance policies issued number 2 318 2008 insurance policies issued number 3 126 2009 insurance policies issued around 17 2011 insurance alta policy issued 25 2006 policy number C 30-0128414 approximations all others as may be discovered this is for one home folks documents three properties involved two purchase agreements two promissory notes one good faith estimate with various fields from different loan applications making it clear there are three loans entwined in this one good faith estimate two titles two or three separate loan applications for two separate amounts several forged and fraudulent affidavit signatures and contingencies with my name affidavit from me Rachel Diddy stating facts based on my personal knowledge and supported by documentation which plaintiffs 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 can sayeth not. See Exhibit 11. That's the affidavit she did. Approximately 455 pages of documents in the affidavit of identity theft and fraudulent use of my identity by several participants that I reported upon discovery. Others as may be discovered. See Exhibit 11. Attachment 3 CD docs. That's a, uh, um, a disc. There's three of them. There's attachment 3. There's CDs and documents. Properties and former corner current owners involved via fax and recorded entries Carol Simpson John Simpson Jeff me happy Leslie Lane Annette Scott Charles Scott Pamela Medford Pamela White but this is how it went Pamela White had the 422 Randolph Street and that's who judge Medford that's who judge Horn was uh, in charge of right Gertens is she listed at West End Bank. Gertens listed as Burns Enterprise, actual physical address, 1803 South I Street, Richmond. New owners of the 938 South 17th Street that had my property rolled up in it in October 2012 properties and was sold by Sheriff's Deed on April 2009 by Deutsche Bank as trustee for Carrington Mortgage. See Exhibit 10. See Met's Life's press release in 2011. Exhibit 12. That's where Met Life said that their bank was going to go out of business. The regulations were too tough. That's what they did. They demutualized, started a bank, sold, robbed the pension funds, then went over and did the buy, sell, sell, buy on the mortgage side by backdating the Alta title policies and the potential buyer's name by a number of years, therefore making the buyer the seller at the closing table, folks. So counterclaims against U.S. Bank National Association, MetLife Metropolitan Life Trust, set up in unison with demutualization, mirrors, or, and or MBRS, First Horizon Home Loans, Jessica McGuire, First Tennessee Bank, Stickle Properties, LLC, Paul Stickle, a.k.a. Paul Steckler, Lingle Real Estate Incorporated, Tim Orr, Abstracts of Richmond Incorporated, Sean Sorrell, Sabrina Bartram, Brian Steckler, FNC, FNC Title Insurance for Commonwealth Land and Title, All Things Financial, 
Copyrighted DTZ JJ Barnicky Canadian, Brandon Allen, Lingles Josh Rader, Paul Stickle Sellers Agent, Kristen Rader, Lingles Sellers Agent for Stickle Properties LLC, and Paul Stickle et al. There may be more persons and entities yet to be discovered and or discoverable. Counterclaims more specifically. This is where, this is the only thing they answered. U.S. Bank National Association for not exercising reasonable care in taking on obligations of previous servicer for lack of following their own recently recent standards adopted by national settlement. That includes Indiana as a named participant for not exercising reasonable care in that allowing my stolen identity to be involved further in collaboration of a complex screen, scheme to defraud home buyers, banks, government entities, insurance, IRS, and foreign entities for submitting forged and falsified documents to this court with forged signatures and misrepresentations, including veiled possibly criminal allegations against me by referring to me as the maker. In their first complaint, filing with this honorable court, this maker is a term I had not heard before, but I have been told that it places liability on persons depending on how the term is used. So does borrower Judge Horn. How do you expect her to pay? How did you expect a woman with two small children? How, how dare you? How dare you? Two, you've got, you're running two separate mortgages and two warranty deeds, and you made her pay to your court, and when she tried to, you reject it. You've done every deep down dirty trick you all possibly can, and you still can't when you dug yourself in a deeper hole because you look really, really bad. There's one property, there's two warranty deeds, there's two mortgages, and they're all different, and you got a clerk over there calling the FBI to tell him that what I'm showing her and what she's seeing that's certified is not in her record. You got a mom's mortgage. You're running them through your circuit court. And I knew it before I ever, before she ever put in the fake mortgage, didn't I? Mm, mm, mm. I've been told it places liability on persons depending on how the term is used. Of course, this is the way Fowdy and Fowdy operates on a regular basis in unison with various banking and business entities like Tammy Lynn Ortman and Jennifer Ortman of Lewis and Caps. The legal maneuvers of not serving Capital One yet naming a financial institution as they know this allows floodgates to open as to further suits against me. It is obvious on its face that the plaintiffs through their attorneys Fowdy and Fowdy are extremely predatory and prey on edu uneducated consumers. Any and all other laws that apply will, as will be discovered. Furthermore, will the plaintiffs not notifying the Capital One but stating that there are other possible liens open the door to subsequent suits put falsely against me and subsequently to my minor children? Question. Both the purchase agreements, lines 199 under 19, miscellaneous refer to, gee, this agreement shall be construed under and in accordance with the laws of the state of Indiana and is binding upon the parties, respective heirs, executors, administrators, legal representatives, successors, and assigns. Then comes U.S. Bank National Association presenting a forged and fraudulently used contract of a supposed date of January 1, 2011, with the same verbiage. The U.S. Bank actually had been assigned the last loan and came in as a first lien holder and tie the heirs, etc. up once again to unload the fraudulent loans back onto the consumer. The pattern is provable and it is massive. See Defendant's Exhibit 2, Rachel Diddy Affidavit. MetLife, including the Metropolitan Life Trust, set up in unison with the demutualization. They were the true lenders initially and several major questions. How could this have ever happened? Why would they allow several loans in one name to enter the system? Why would they conceal or hide the fact? Why did they purge the loans from their system? <laughs> uh, mirrors for running my forged and falsified and fraudulently obtained loan documents into a mortgage takings and insurance mail that ran approximately however different ways they choose to spell my name for allow and that's what the court does right because mirrors mill is the court for allowing because they're operating in two capacities just because a judge says they're a nominee that's just for the benefit of the public on the other side they're not the, they're the beneficiary. They're, they're operating in a way they're directing the courts how to do it. They're either the beneficiary or they're the trustee. They're, they're, they are, they are doing these things and they bring in lawyers and the lawyer says, I'm representing the plaintiff, but she never says who the plaintiff is, correct? Lingo real estate, Tim Moore, mortgage fraud, fraud theft, predatory behavior and practice, failure to disclose, misrepresentation, usury, conspiring with others to commit identity theft and fraudulent use of my identity to gain something, and to my and my minor children's detriment, mortgage fraud and, and, and identity theft. Any and all other laws that apply as will be discovered.
And remember, folks, I can't type very well. Rachel's typing this, and we did our best. First Horizon Home Loans, First Tennessee Bank, All Things Financial, Copyright, Jessica McGuire, Fraud, Theft, Predatory Behavior and Practices, Failure to Disclose, Misrepresentation, Usury, Conspiring with Others, Commit Identity Theft, and Fraudulent Use of My Identity to Gain Something and to My and My, my mine Children's Detriment. Any and all other laws that apply. Abstracts of Richmond Incorporated, Sean Sorrell, Sabrina Bartram, as per signatures and seals, and lack of effective action taken on my behalf. Robin Moore for acting in bad faith and failing to mitigate by taking no corrective actions concerning all the issues involving the business abstracts of Richmond. I want to add this, Neil and Rich, that um, uh, title abstracts of Richmond came in under the court in recent court papers they put in further affidavits into this court case so they perpetrated the fraud they knew they committed in the first place so Robin Moore of abstracts title of Richmond and uh, Sean Sorrell who's in all the documents clear back in 2006 she's a notary she needs to be arrested she's a criminal she's forged affidavits stating someone's married when they were never married and that's her notary seal and also, Stickle Properties, a.k.a. Paul Steckler, Fraud, Theft, Predatory Behavior and Practices, Failure to Disclose, Misrepresentation, Usury, Conspiring to Others to Commit Identity Theft and Fraudulent Use of My Identity to Gain Something and to Use to Break Laws Therein to the Detriment of Me and My Children and Any and All Other Laws that Apply. Lingle's Josh Rader as Paul Stickle's seller's agent and as Kristen Rader, Lingle's seller agent for Stickle Properties and Paul Stickle as Paul Stickle's seller's agent and as to activities stated above in Stickle per signatures. Brian Steckler, formerly Vice President, Illinois and Indiana State Agency Manager, Land America during 1991 through 2008 and since December 2008 until presently Vice President, State Manager, Account Manager, Fidelity National Title, and now Title Insurance for Commonwealth Land and Title, off the policy 2006. Mr. Steckler is principal in an agency relationship or former agency relationship with Abstracts of Richmond Incorporated. I met, I went to him after attempting resolution of possible title questions with Abstracts of Richmond and Lingle. Tim Moore and Tim Moore as early as mid October 2012 from Brian Steckler as FNF agent and other interest he has or ever had with others for lack of any effective action taken on my behalf and under the Alta policy that was backdated approximately two years. He supposes that a foreclosure action against me forecloses any obligation his company had and totally exploited and then ridiculed me for my allegations of identity theft and fraud by an employee under the Alta policy issued to me on February 5th 2006 and 2008. He acted in bad faith and failed to act effectively to resolve the title clouding issues and therefore failed to mitigate. DTZ JJ Barnicky Canadian Brandon Allen P.O. Box I think it's P.O. Box 809 right? Pretty sure that's 809. Let me see if I've got th I think I copied that. I hope so. Yeah let's see if I did. Yeah, Memphis, Tennessee, right? Send payments. All things financial, copyright here in the United States, the broad all things financial, LTD Canada, any and all applicable laws, cases, codes, treaties, etc. allowed for me to use against the above and for myself and my minor children of the state of Indiana, federal laws of the United States of America, Americas, and international law, including treaties, family, probate, property, bank, insurance, trust laws, and statutes. The above facts, along with the fact that the alleged perpetrators above above have all been contacted as early as October 2012. They've been talked to extensively. They know what they've done. And that judge held five of us in the courtroom. My husband um, and two guys from Fort Wayne, Gabriel and myself, and I was brought back in while he ran a fake mortgage. Absolutely no responsive actions to the fraud and identity theft allegations I have made in connection with my experience as a first-time home buyer with Lingo Real Estate have fallen on deaf ears and turned their eyes away from their misdeeds that have occurred to date. The case warrants further discovery and facts and then outcomes is an important issue that will affect the public, economic, and housing industry. The buck stops at the court of law and I am asking to represent and defend myself because I can find no attorney that has no conflict with the other parties and I believe I can prove that US Bank is not first lien holder 
and actually has been assigned a fraudulent loan based on a second purchase agreement that I was tricked into signing. That said, Lean has falsified and forged documents and that all the players, including U.S. Bank, knew or should have known based on the available evidence, including the wrongful foreclosure action against me. Wherefore, Defendant Rachel Diddy prays for this Honorable Judge Horn to allow me to proceed pro se and allows me to submit this amended answer to complaint as first complaint, including all attachments in paper and disc form, as new and disregarding the former, for it is incorporated herein. This answer includes my denials and defenses and counterclaims. In addition, the answer names persons specifically identified as the perpetrators of my allegations of theft and my identity and use of my identity to perpetrate mortgage, bank, and insurance fraud. I have also included persons of interest relating to the transactions surrounding my home at 422 Randolph Street. And my prayer for relief, as your honor so decides, is appropriate. I am requesting that this answer to complaint with exhibits be accepted as first answer or amended and put in place of my previous filings from me. I am asking this wrongful foreclosure act action be stayed until all facts are in the open and decided upon by courts of law and or th the issues are resolved. I am requesting relief and a resolution to the fraud that occurred under my name, my stolen identity, and there is an easier way to get to the end and I am all for it. I also do not intend to be difficult. However, it is my understanding I must plead the facts and not lay on any of my rights and remedies in this matter. That being said, I would like to ask U.S. Bank's case be dismissed against myself and let all others fight it out. However, it is my understanding that since the named persons I have alleged stole my identity and forged my signature while committing fraud, that I have no choice but to defend myself. And it is because of the named plaintiffs and others' fraudulent wrongful actions that I have to do so. Uh, I further ask for the trial by judge and by jury if relevant facts are brought that show a trial by jury would also be appropriate on issues that may arise. Richard and what he did was he brought in a specialist to give hearings and they and they prosecuted her. They created parole evidence to bring her to a parole demise. That's what the judge did. And he thought nothing he thought nothing of it. Rachel Diddy asked this court to protect and preserve her remedies available under the law as the facts emerge. The plaintiff's US Bank National Association NA are attempting to gain a security interest, then complain or establish through falsified and sanitized document a note. Then they moved to foreclose without any of the other parties of interest in this, which I have included herein. I will continue to be to diligently look for an attorney in the meantime. I wish to get this resolved as expediently as possible, so I'm ready to proceed alone for now. Appreciate your time and attention and patience. Respectfully submitted, December 28th, and she signed it. And she showed her name. Copies of certified mail will be sent today, and they went out. Camping World. Ten. One to court, one to me, eight to others. Defenses, including affirmative defenses. U.S. Bank like standing against me or my minor children. Because they're foreclosing on people, folks. Then I go into all that hoop-la-la-la-la. Precision, -la -la -la. lack of jurisdiction. Been a diligent complaint, each cause of action. Common law, doctrine of estoppel by pace, I think is what I said, or she said. Told her to say. By acquiescence, defendant claims lack of privity. Defendant alleges that plaintiff's actions are precluded, whereas plaintiff's demands for interest are unusurious and violate state and federal laws. Defendant alleges the plaintiff or person or the entity that assigned the alleged claim to the plaintiff is not entitled to reimbursement of attorney fees because the alleged contract did not include such a provision and there is no law that otherwise allows them. Plaintiff admits accepting the defaulted debt allegedly owned by the defendant, causing plaintiff's injury to its own self. Therefore, plaintiff is barred from seeking relief for damages for damages from plaintiff. Plaintiff's complaint fails to allege a valid assignment. There are no aver averments as to the nature of the purported assignment or evidence of valuable consideration. Plaintiff's complaint fails to allege whether or not the purported assignment was partial or complete. And there is no evidence that the purported assignment was bona fide. Plaintiff's complaint fails to prove that the assigner even has knowledge of this action or that the assigner has conveyed all rights and control to the plaintiff. The record does not disclose this information factually and it cannot be assumed without creating an unfair prejudice against the defendant. Defendant claims accord and satisfaction as defendant alleges that the original creditor accepted payment from a third party for the alleged debt or a portion of the alleged debt or that the original creditor received other compensation in the form of monies and or credits. Defendant alleges plaintiff's complaint in each cause of action therein is barred by the doctrine of estoppel, specifically estoppel in pace. Defendant alleges that plaintiff's actions are precluded whereas plaintiff's demands for interest are usurious and violate state laws and federal laws. 
defendant alleges the plaintiff or the person or entity that assigned the alleged claim to the plaintiff is not entitled to reimbursement of attorney fees because the alleged contract did not include such a provision. There is no law that otherwise allows them. I think I did that twice. Plaintiff's complaint alleges damages as a result of acts or omissions committed by non-parties to this action over whom the defendant has no responsibility or control. Plaintiff's complaint alleges damages are a result of acts of omissions committed by the plaintiff. Defendant alleges that the granting of the plaintiff's demand the complainant would result in unjust enrichment. The plaintiff could receive more money than the plaintiff is entitled to receive. Failure to state a claim upon which relief may be granted. Either no statute was cited or the complaint fails to state state fails to state facts sufficient to constitute a cause of action as against the defendant. Plaintiff's failure to mitigate damage, plaintiff's statute of limitations, since a court will not grant a judgment or other legal relief to a party who has not acted fairly by having made false representations or concealing material facts from the other party, we maintain the equitable, est equitable estoppel bars plaintiff's claim. Defendant reserves the right to amend and or add additional answers, defenses, and or counterclaims at a later date. Defendant claims accord and satisfaction as defendant alleges that the original creditor accepted payment from a third party for the alleged debt or a portion of the alleged debt, that the original creditor received other compensation in the form of monies and or credits, a missing assignment of mortgages evidence when there is a gap in the chain of title from the originating lender to the purported current mortgagee. These gaps are places where if another party was assigned the borrower's loan at some point in time, there should have been an assignment of mortgage executed. Using my stolen identity to perpetrate bank loan insurance, real estate, and occupancy fraud in my name. They stole my identity fraud and frauded many, and I was a customer that had come in from the street to buy my first home. And this has just been a horrible experience. I am appalled and can use this fact as well. It is a disheartening experience that no one should have to endure from seemingly trusted professional. Doctrines, any and all available to me, is standing in, the, and in my defenses of this wrongful action. Federal, state, and international laws that are found to apply in my defense of this wrongful action and discovered identity theft, fraudulent use of my identity by newly named persons acting as agents for various business, banking, and insurance entities. Indiana Constitution, Indiana Codes, Acts 2012, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2000. Non-Code Acts, Indiana Administrative Code, Agency Rule, UCC, any and all applicable laws, cases, codes, treaties, etc. allowed for me to use against the above and for myself and minor children of the state of Indiana and federal laws of the United States of America, America's and international law, including treaties, family, probate, property, bank, insurance, and trust laws and statutes. Title 18 U.S. Code Sections 1001 and 1010. Legal cases and rights to actions. We have long held that the conveyance of real property, such as a mortgage that does not name, the assignee conveys nothing and is void. We do not regard an assignment of land and blank as giving legal, ti legal title and land to a bearer of this assignment. See Flavin v. Morrissey, McCooter v. Fuller, and Constitution, Private Rights, Property, Land Rights, Fraud, Conversion, Identity Theft, Case Law, Common Law, Star Decisis, Presidents, and then the Signature, of course. Other interested parties and persons. Then I go into all the people involved. And there you go, Scott. Here's a software and tool, All Things Financial, copyrighted here in the United States and abroad, All Things Financial, Wolters Kluwer Financial, VMP Mortgage Forms, CBF Systems, Copyright ISO Properties, Copyrighted Material of Insurance Services Office, and the Closed Block, which is a Metropolitan Life Insurance Company. I will forward this to Scott. There you go. Timelines. Let's see what that's about. Oh yeah, this is a good one. I sent this to the judge. And that's the timeline. 
That's the, the timeline we thought it was anyway, right? There you go. Let's see what this one is. Yeah, there's a There you go, Scott. Good night, honey. And he didn't correct anything until 8 2. Let's see if he corrected the name there. I'll bet you anything. It's a different name now. Oh, now he finally corrected it, right? Filed July 29, 2013. Finally corrected it. Had to keep telling him. I have a thing. We just wanted him to uh, oh, I think that's too much. Anchor date and title policy. Mirrors versus Scott. Oh, yeah. That's a draft. Services, summons, and responses. They never answered. They just brought in this chick, right? Camper World. Mirrors. Fatty and Fatty. Lingo Real Estate. Abstracts of Richmond. This one is for Fidelity. It was unserverable. We talked to Brian Steckler from Fidelity. And MetLife Bank, the 809. It was no longer there. What does it say there? Box was closed, see? Hmm. Let's see if that was all. P.O. Box 809, Memphis, Tennessee, which is the DTZ Barnicky brand in Allen for MetLife, right? Mm 
Wayne County Court, Superior Court, and they got that, right? I'm sure they hated to be served, but since they're listed up there as party, the party to it, I think what I'll do is forward that to myself for tomorrow.